after Morgoth had destroyed the two trees of Valinor, stolen the Silmarils, and returned to his old fortress of Angband, he began a war upon the peoples of Middle-earth that would cast the realm into a bleak and fiery despair. Yet despite the inevitability of the doom facing them, there were those who stood against the tide. The first race to rise against the host of Morgoth were the immortal Eldar, who fought in the wars of Beleriand, and continued their valiant struggle during the War of Wrath. As readers, the idea of militant elves is fascinating, but Tolkien rarely disclosed much information on how Eldar armies functioned. However, one can make educated guesses if one reads between the lines. In this video, we will discuss the history and society of the Eldar of the First Age and their military contributions against the Dark Lord of the North. As we bring the world of Middle-earth to life in this video, we'd also like to pass on some equally brilliant worlds to you. We're sponsored today by Chepeku, makers of high-quality maps for tabletop adventures. If you've got a D&D or Pathfinder campaign that needs a burst of imagination for its visuals, Chepeku have you covered. They have over 4,000 beautiful maps, covering too many scenarios to mention. Here we're showing you only a random smattering of what's on offer. Every stage of an adventure is covered, and there are variation maps to alter the season or time of day too. You've probably noticed they come in animated form. Chepeku maps can be seamlessly used in most virtual tabletop programs, where they shine even more with visual and audio effects. To get these maps, head over to the Chepeku Patreon and subscribe to the Master Cartographer tier for $5 a month. That gives you everything and all the new stuff being added constantly. Or you can go to chepeku.com to purchase individual map sets. So go grab these enhancements to your next adventure via our links in the description. The Eldar began as the Vanyar, Noldor and Teleri, who spoke the languages of Vanyarin, Quenya, Noldorin, Quenya and Telerin. During the Great Journey, while the Noldor, Vanyar and some Teleri travelled to the undying lands of Valinor, many of the Teleri chose to stay in Middle-earth, becoming known as the Sindar and Nandor. The Sindar and Nandor could be further divided into subgroups of their own. These constituted the Lyquendi, who later became Sylvan, the Irathrim, Falathrim and Mithrim. The Teleri would be the first race of Eldar, whom Morgoth would face in battle after returning to Middle-earth. None of the Teleri, except the Falmari, would ever see the light of the Two Trees of Valinor. Those who dwelt closer to the Two Trees were imbued with power through their light. Because of this, the Vanyar, Noldor, Falmari and Sindarin King Thingol became known as High Elves. Of the three Eldar races, each had a preference for a specific type of weaponry, although it was by no means exclusive. The Vanyar preferred spears, the Noldor swords and shields, the Teleri bows, and the Nandor preferred axes. Through the sparse use of numbers in his books, Tolkien seems to have modelled army sizes in Middle-earth based on ancient and medieval armies of our world. Based on this, Tolkien scholars like Stephen Wigmore and Tom Lubeck have provided us with a good estimation of the Eldar populations during the First Age and their forces. Let us begin with the Teleri. In general, the Teleri favoured a guerrilla style of warfare. Because they were less imbued with strength from the light of the trees, they concealed themselves and avoided open ground battles. They typically used smaller formations and the element of surprise to attack enemy forces, primarily with bows from a distance and axes up close. Of the Teleri armies, the greatest was that of the Eathrim. Dwelling in Doriath, they were led by Eluthingol, who preferred a policy of isolation and avoiding conflict with Morgoth. Doriath was one of the largest elven kingdoms, where most of the Sindar resided, and whose population outnumbered the Noldor. Doriath enjoyed numerous allies that aided in her defence. Thingol was friends with Círdan, the shipwright and the leader of the Falathrim, who defended Beleriand's western flank. The Falathrim were lightly armed mariner people, with slender bows, who used ships similar to those used by the Vikings of our world. During the second assault of Hithlam, Círdan's navy performed an amphibious assault routing a host of orcs before dispatching a unit of mounted archers to finish them off. Thingol was also friends with Denethor, leader of the Lyquendi, whom he gave permission to settle in Osirian. The Lyquendi were Nandor, a simple woodland folk with no weapons or armour of steel. The Lyquendi defended the eastern flank of Beleriand with axes and bows. Their style of warfare was akin to that of the ancient Celts of Iron Age Europe. During the First Battle of Beleriand, many of the Lyquendi and their leader Denethor died facing a host of orcs, who held an advantage due to their possession of iron-shod weaponry. 
After this, the Lequendi became reclusive, resorting to camouflaging themselves in green and avoiding war, thus becoming known as the Green Elves. Thingol also allied his people with the Dwarves of Belagost and Nogrod, who helped build his capital of Menegroth. As Dwarves and Lequendi mingled with Doriath, they brought ill news of fell beasts spreading north and east, prompting Thingol to arm his people. The smiths of Belagost, such as Telchar, his master Gamril Zirak the Old, and elven rites like Eol the Dark Elf, forged mail of linked rings, axes, spears, swords, tall helms, long coats of bright mail, and hauberks that would fill Thingol's armories. When wolves, orcs, and other fell creatures began encroaching into Beleriand, they were met by Thingol's principal army unit, the March Wardens. March Wardens guarded the borders of Doriath, typically in company strength. They acted as rangers, primarily using axes and longbows. The Noldor king, Fingon, led a mixed Noldor Teleri force in Hithlum, and some were horseback archers. It may be possible that the March Wardens preferred this way of war when mounted. The March Warden would fight several more border skirmishes against these fell creatures in a conflict which came to be known as the War of the Marches. Notable March Warden commanders included Mablon the Heavy Hand, the Chief Captain to King Thingol, and Beleg Cuthalian the Strongbow, Chief March Warden of Doriath. It is possible Tolkien based these elven marshals on the real-world Lord Warden of the Marches, who was responsible for guarding the border of Scotland and England during the High Middle Ages. Doriath held an enormous advantage against her enemies regarding provisions, for Thingol's wife Melian held the recipe from Yavanna for Lembus. This recipe would be passed on to Galadriel and other elves. During the First Battle of Beleriand, Morgoth unleashed two great hosts of orcs into Beleriand. The orcs advanced south and around either side of Menegroth, cutting off Thingol's line of communication to Círdan and Denethor. Thingol rushed to Denethor's aid, whose Lyquendi were lightly armed with bows and axes, and were no match for the orcs, wielding iron shields, swords, and greater spears. Denethor was surrounded at Amon Erib, and was slain just before the host of Thingol avenged him by striking into the rear of the orc formation north of Adram. The orc host was routed, fleeing north, where dwarves of the Blue Mountains nearly slaughtered them all. Meanwhile, the small Thalathrim force was overwhelmed by the western host of orcs, and pushed to the edge of the sea, where they were besieged for months, until the return of the Noldor saved them. Doriath and her allies had suffered heavy losses, prompting Melian to create the Girdle of Melian, a fence of enchantment set around Doriath, preventing any from entering the land without her or Thingol's consent. Doriath and her allies could not hope to meet Morgoth out on the open field of battle, thus this enchantment saved them. Concealing themselves and ambushing their enemies was to be their only means of resistance. There was a time of great peace, until the Battle of a Thousand Caves, whereupon Doriath and her allies were routed easily by a great host of dwarves of Nogrod, and Menegroth was attacked. The confined battle within the city favoured the dwarves, seeing Menegroth defeated and sacked. Yet afterwards, during the Battle of Sarnathrad, the dwarves, burdened with spoils of war, were ambushed by a host of Lyquendi led by Berin Arcamion with the further aid of a drove of Ents. The element of surprise and concealment of the forest allowed the elves to slay the dwarves with arrows. Overall, the Teleri preferred guerrilla-style warfare, choosing to stay concealed and rely on ambush tactics. When forced into melee, many Teleri wielded axes, as they were not great steelworkers and had to rely on dwarves and other Eldar for better weaponry. As for cavalry, it is possible they preferred to fight as mounted archers when on horseback. The Teleri were the best mariners of all the Eldar, as seen with the Thalathrim. The next group of Eldar that Morgoth would face were the Noldor, who were beloved by Auli the smith and taught how to forge things out of metal and stone. While imprisoned, Melkor spread lies amongst the Noldor, and this prompted them to forge all manner of weapons, their favoured being longswords and shields. For armour, they adorned tall helmets and wore mostly chainmail. Four notable groups of Noldor would travel back to Middle-earth. Fëanor's exiled followers, led by Mithros, ruled the lands of East Beleriand. Fingolfin's followers reigned over Hithlum. Fingolfin's son, Turgon, ruled over Gondolin. And Finrod Felagund ruled over Nargothrond. During the Battle of Dagor Nuin Gilead, despite being outnumbered, taken by surprise, and before a proper encampment or defence could be made, Fëanor's force swiftly defeated a host of orcs and wolf riders. 
Consequently, Morgoth was forced to dispatch his host, assailing Thalas, to steal back victory. Empowered by the light of Valinor, the Noldor battled for ten days, seeing the near annihilation of both hosts. Through their tight sword and shield formations, their reliance on tall helms, their chainmail armor, and their imbued power from the light of Valinor, the Noldor were able to overwhelm Morgoth's lesser units. The Battle of Aglareb saw Morgoth open two fronts, through the land of Maglor in the east and through the pass of Syrian in the west. The Noldor, led by Fingulfin and Mithros, with the aid of the ships of Thallus, performed a hammer and anvil maneuver against the Orc hosts in the plains of Lothlan and Ardgallan. Within Maglor's gap, there was a large open plain surrounding Himring, and when the Orcs entered East Beleriand, the sons of Fëanor attacked them with cavalry. Given the Orcs they face carried iron weapons and armor, it can be guessed the Noldor would have preferred to meet them with heavy cavalry, while their Sindar allies preferred mounted archers. The Orcs were enveloped in the vice, and most were killed before they withdrew to Angband. This battle displayed the excellent lines of communication between the Noldor and their allies, stretching nearly all across Middle-earth. The Siege of Angband saw the Noldor build strong fortified positions all across Middle-earth during the Long Peace. Morgoth realized he could not defeat the Noldor through any means except trickery and overwhelming superiority in numbers, so he devised new methods. Morgoth would employ stealth, treachery, and enchantment of prisoners to undermine Eldar society, all while creating formidable fell beasts for his host, such as dragons and belrocks. Meanwhile, the Noldor and their allies were unable to overcome Angband's fortifications, rendering the encirclement of Angband incomplete. During the siege, Morgoth sent an army of orcs to assail King Fingon's realm of Hithlum. Fingon reigned over a Noldor and Sindar force, favoring both people's battle methods. Using only a fraction of his forces, King Fingon fell upon the orcs from the hills, and his Falathrim allies performed an amphibious assault, taking by surprise the orcs at the Firth of Dengrist. Combined, both elven forces drove many of the orcs into the sea, and their horseback archers chased them to the Iron Mountains. After this, a young and half-grown Glaurung assaulted the Noldor from Ard Galen to Dothonion and Erdwethrin without Morgoth's permission. In response, Fingon led a troop of horseback archers to attack Glaurung, forcing him back to Angband. Another Noldor force Morgoth would face were the elves of Nagathrond, led by Finrod Felagund. Inspired by Menegroth of Doriath, Finrod established a hidden kingdom of his own. Kelagorm Kurafin spoke to its people of a vision of war and ruin of Nagathrond. This prompted the elves of Nagathrond until the time of Turin never to give open battle, but instead use stealth, ambush, wizardry, and venomed darts. The military of Nagathrond consisted of Noldor and Sindar, who performed a style of guerrilla warfare akin to Doriath. They utilized scouts and spies to keep watch of Morgoth's forces around Talath Denim. This would all change when Turin Tarambar became one of the chief captains of Nagathrond. Turin did not like Nagathrond's strategy of ambush, stealth, and secret arrow, yearning instead for the brave strokes of open battle. Turin gradually persuaded Orodreth to build the bridge of Nagathrond, allowing their army to swiftly go out and give war to the hosts of Morgoth. Because of this, Morgoth was able to locate Nagathrond, spelling its doom. Another Noldor force Morgoth faced was the hidden city of Gondolin. Ruled by Turgon, Gondolin was concealed from Morgoth and friends alike by the encircling mountains, guarded by the eagles of Thorondor. The Gondolindrim were a mix of Noldor and Sindar, who forged all manner of swords, axes, spears, bows, coats of mail armor, brinnies, hauberks, greaves, vambraces, helms, and shields. The famous weapons Glamdring, Orcrist, and Sting were of Gondolin make. Being Noldor dominated, the soldiers of Gondolin favored the sword and shield. Gondolin was unique in that it was divided into specialized houses, each of which excelled in a specific area. Of the twelve houses of Gondolin, some specialized in specific weaponry. The houses of Swallow and Heavenly Arch were Gondolin's best bowmen. The houses of Pillar and Tower of Snow fought with iron-studded clubs or slings and the House of Hammer of Wrath fought with great maces like hammers and heavy shields. During the Battle of Nernaeth Anuidiad, Turgon opened the League of Gondolin with a 10,000-strong army that fought in a phalanx formation, breaking through the ranks of the Orcs. In the Second Age, the humans of Numenor adopted a similar phalanx strategy, forming closely pressed ranks that used a barrier of shields. 
In Quenya, the phalanx was called Sandestan, and in Sindarin, Thangail. Perhaps indicating the origin of the formation lies with the elves. Another Numenorean war formation, the Durnaith, was a wedge formation launched over a short distance, known in Quenya as Nuneta. This battle formation was also potentially of elven origin. Overall, the Noldor preferred to face their enemies out on the field, primarily while wielding swords and shields. Their infantry adopted phalanx warfare, and when mounted, it seems likely they heavily utilized horseback archery. The armies of the Noldor were the equivalent of the armies of the ancient Greeks or Romans. The last race of Eldar whom Morgoth would have to face were the Vanyar, who stood against the Dark Tide during the War of Wrath. The hosts of the Valar were composed of Vanyar, led by Ingwion, the remaining Noldor of Valinor under Finarfin, and possibly some Maiar and Valar. We are given very little information on the participation of the Vanyar during the war that raged for 40 years. It is said they marched under white banners and slew Morgoth's countless fell beasts. So mighty were they that even the majority of the Balrogs perished against them. They were so formidable that Morgoth was forced to unleash dragons upon the host of the Valar to keep them contained. Because of how close the Vanyar resided to the trees of Valinor, it's reasonable to believe they were the physically strongest of the Eldar. The Vanyar, unlike the Teleri and Noldor, had not spent as much time in Middle-earth, and were thus less diminished. They also did not suffer the doom of Mandos. However, the Vanyar had little to no experience in war. Through the eyes of Tolkien, a veteran of the Somme, the Vanyar can be seen through the same lens as the Americans who entered battle during World War I in 1918, when the war was almost over, and the British, French and Germans had already endured four years of hell. While the war had greatly diminished the Teleri and Noldor, the Vanyar, like the Americans, came in great numbers to swing the tide of the war, despite lacking previous battlefield experience. Overall, the Vanyar favoured the spear, a weapon that would take less skill to use than the sword or bow. They most likely performed the phalanx as their primary battle formation, like their Noldor counterparts. Meanwhile, their mounted units fought as shock troopers, fulfilling the role of the lancer. Similar to their Noldor cousins, they could be seen as akin to ancient Greeks or Macedonians in terms of their way of waging war. In conclusion, the elves of Valinor and Middle-earth fought their battles in varied ways. The Teleri armies were akin to Nordic Bronze Age warriors, preferring guerrilla-style warfare to ambush their enemies with bows and axes, with some also specializing as mariners. The Noldor armies were akin to ancient Greeks, Romans or early medieval warriors, preferring battle on the open field with a sword and shield, adopting formations like the phalanx and heavy cavalry. Meanwhile, the Vanya armies were similar to the Noldor, though specializing in the spear, which was typical of ancient Macedonians in terms of warfare. We will continue talking about Tolkien's armies of the First Age and beyond in our future videos, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel and we will catch you on the next one.